gold stocks are extreme value right now. If you look at the, I look at the HUI um, to gold, right? And that's around um, uh, 8.5 right now. Um, it peaked at 10 uh, a few years ago, but it's hardly ever been over nine. So that tells you that gold stocks are very undervalued compared to the gold price. And um, take a position, hold it, don't look at the market every day, and <laughs> let the market come to you. Welcome back to Soar Financially, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. And we have a really interesting discussion lined up for you today because we're here in our studio in Vancouver and we're making use of the, that opportunity to catch up with Bob Thompson. He's Senior Portfolio Manager over at Raymond James, somebody we've had on the program a couple of times now. Um, He's the portfolio manager of the mining CEOs, but he's also a frequent guest on Sprott Money. So we're going to chat with him about, of course, the macro environment. Where are we at right now? How is the economy doing? But how are the commodities doing? And then I'm going to quiz him a little bit like, what are his clients doing? I don't want to hear specific names or anything, obviously, but I want to hear sentiment. Are they just coming to him to cry on his shoulder or are they actually actively deploying capital? And to, what might they be buying? I'm not sure how much he can share, right? He works with Raymond James. so. Compliance might be an issue there, but uh, we'll, I'll, I'll get to the root of that because uh, we're here early September now, and that's usually a bit of a more positive month uh, for for the miners, at least, because uh, a lot of conferences and things happening. So positive momentum in the market. Before I switch over to my guest, quickly, please subscribe to this channel. I know 80, 85 percent of you watching are not subscribed. Highly appreciate it. We could change that so I can bring guests like Bob Thompson on more regularly and to guests of other great caliber, of course, as well. Now, let me switch over to my guest. And uh, Bob, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be on the show again, Kai. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we've, we've chatted uh, numerous times. I think yeah. last time was in January, right. so long overdue to catch up. Um, let, let's start with a bit of a holistic, a bit of a summary question, Bob. It's how are we doing? How's the market? How's the economy doing? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I come at this this sector, the commodity sector, as a generalist, right? We can buy anything for our clients. And I think it's important because you you can kind of, you don't get stuck in the in the trees in the forest, right? You can see from above and see what's doing well, not doing well outside of the outside of the sector. And and, and obviously I, I think in the in you know, we all know what's done well. We all know what did well up until a second ago, but the key is where are we going? Mm -hmm. And you know, somebody named Howard Marks, who I, I want to mention. Howard Marks is a great money manager in the U.S., and this pertains to, to what we're talking about here. He did a report recently called Sea Change, December of 2022, and I, I would encourage everybody to Google that, read that report. It's 10 or 11 pages. He said in his 53 years in the business, there's only been three sea change events, paradigm shifts. Uh, one was in the late 60s, and we had something called the Nifty 50 stocks, something similar that's happening right now, where all these big blue chip stocks uh, were trading at nosebleed valuations. Nobody worried about commodities. Nobody was concerned. But what that caused is an inflationary bubble in the 70s, right? Then in the, in the 80s, he said people became big risk takers again, right? The market didn't do anything in the 70s, but in the 80s, uh, people became big risk takers. So high yield bonds came into vogue, leveraged buyouts. He said that was a sea change because companies that were of lower quality had access to capital in the debt markets. And that was huge. That changed the investing landscape for many, many years. And he said, recently, we've had our third sea change in, in 53 years. And I think that's really important. He, 2021, 2022, he said, this is when it's happened. Things are going to look a lot different in the next 10 years as to what happened in the past. And, and I, I suspect that's going to favor the, the mining sector because, you know, the last the first sea change in the late 60s, you know, we had a great run in the 70s. And I think that's probably what's going to happen. And to, to make a long story short about what he said, he said, we're all used to zero to two percent interest rates in the last 15 years since 2008. And he said, all it takes is for us to have two to four two two to four percent interest rates instead of zero to two. He said that's a massive, massive change. It, it it's a deleveraging event, um, and it causes inflation, et cetera. So I, I think we're we're in that sort of cycle. And although he doesn't talk about commodities, he talks about the fact that things that do well over the next 10 years are going to be completely different than the things that did well over the last 10 or 12 years. Absolutely. Just look at commercial real estate. There's so many things that, that we're witnessing on a daily basis, right? right? right. So Airbnb changing completely <clears throat> the, the game of real estate investing sure. and uh, with the zero to 2% rates, a feasible business model for many, right? Right, exactly, exactly. And all these tech companies who are trading at these high valuations who could raise capital for free, it's tougher now. And, and people, when interest rates are higher, are actually going to examine an investment and say, is this a good quality investment or not? 
you know, you're, they're just not going to throw money at it, yeah. right? Like, Absolutely. No, that's yeah. that's definitely changing. Like, how do you, how fragile do you think the economy is? You brought up inflation because I think that's going to stay at a higher rate than everybody expects it to be. Right. So, how, how fragile is the economy overall? I think the the, the economy is very fragile. Um, interest rates didn't go up by four percent over the last year. They went up by four hundred percent. People forget that, <laughs> right? One percent to five percent. You know, it's four or five hundred percent that it went up. That's the exact same thing as interest rates going from five percent, starting at five percent, and going to twenty percent or twenty-five percent. If that had happened, we'd we'd all say, "Oh, we'd be in big trouble." But that's that's exactly the magnitude of what's what's happened here. The interest rate increase was the fastest in history. It hasn't gone through the economy yet, right? I was talking to people in in, in the real estate industry, and obviously there were projects that were started a year or two ago that they have to complete. So things are still rolling. They're still completing those projects, but they're not starting in new ones. So that's how why the economy 18 months later tends to do very poorly. There was also trillions of dollars given to people, right? There's also been um, millions and millions of more people on disability, believe it or not, since since 2020, and they've stayed on disability. I mean, we're talking a double of the amount of people on disability. Those people are out of the workforce. So you wonder, well, how is the un unemployment number so great? Right. Well, because if you take millions of people out of the workforce and then 10,000 people a day retiring in the U.S., which is what's happening, all those people are out of the workforce. They're not regarded as unemployed anymore, but they are in government benefits. So and we've now, been wondering where they all went. Right. Right. Because we all exactly. see the help wanted signs on all the plate on all of the restaurants and, and shops. And they're on government benefits. And, and then you look and you say, OK, well, if they're on government benefits, how's our deficits? Well, things are supposedly great in the economy, but they're running a one point seven trillion dollar deficit yeah. telling you that there's a lot of entitlements going out, right? So, so the so so the, and that's an interesting, I think, phenomenon because we might be in a in a place where the economy is contracting, but we still don't have enough workers, even for a contracting economy. So, what does that cause? It causes the Teamsters Union to get a fifty percent wage increase over the next five years. UPS. So, so, so the power is coming back to the working man, <laughs> and that's that's what we call wage push inflation. Which is exactly what the Fed didn't want to happen. I mean, they've said that. They said, we do not want wage push inflation, and we have to make people think. And Powell said this, which I thought was interesting. He said, whatever inflation is, basically, we, we have to make people think that it's going to go back to 2%. Because if people don't think it's going to go back there, they're going to go out and spend money, they're going to ask for, for increases, and that's going to cause inflation. So, um, so this game that they're doing right now, about 2%, 2%, 2%, um, I, I, you know, obviously they want to drill that into people's heads so they don't ask for a 10% wage increase because then we're out of control. And then that's what they call stagflation. Which oh, is that 2% <laughs> wage target or inflation target is right. far, far away from everything. Right. right. So right. I was just standing at the Safeway here and saw a pack of uh, 12 organic eggs for $9. Right. I was like, there's going to be a lot of laid off chickens out there. There, there right? is. <laughs> Absolutely. There's, uh, Absolutely. There's going to be a lot of redundancy. Like, Absolutely. There are going to be a lot of job losses. So I think we got two big things. We've got wage push inflation and we got commodity inflation over the next few years. Because no, as we know, no money has been spent in the commodity sector. So those two areas are big and that's going to cause inflation to keep coming back. Well, we've seen that in the late 70s as well, right? With right. the oil price as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a, sort of a, a, a trickle down or just a butterfly effect, I'd call it, from that, right? So well, Jay Powell is trying to be Jay Volker, right? Or not Jay Volker, Paul Volker. Um, you know, and he said that. He said, what happened in the 70s, they reduced interest rates too quickly and they caused inflation again, so we're not going to let that happen. The only problem is Paul Volker, before he died, said, Jay Powell is trying to be me, <laughs> but he can't be me. And the reason he can't be me is the debt load's too high. That sounds, you, reminds you, me of an Eminem song, by the right, way. <laughs> right, right. <that's> right. <laughs> he can't keep interest rates that high for that long yeah. because there's too much debt. So there's the conundrum. Yeah. There's where we're stuck. We've got to talk about bond yields and how that sort of factors in because high interest rates bring high bond yields. And we're looking at, uh, what is it, 5.5% for the one year, right. for example, or the right. two years at 5.25, I right. believe. So I haven't checked this morning, but right around there. 10 year at 4.4, I believe, somewhere right. around there, 4.3, right. 4.4. So how does that factor in? Sort of also with the commodity, there's competition for the money, right? So 5% right. yield is actually quite attractive. Why put it in a high risk investment like commodities? Right. We, we've got the highest. Um, inversion in rates in 40 years, right? It hasn't been like this since either late 80s or, you know, um, early 80s. And and I think, you know, that that's telling you that that we're going to have something pretty severe happen here, right? 
all the economists, you know, if you all the economists in the world were to hold hands, they still wouldn't reach a conclusion. We've heard that, right? Economists' forecasts are generally not good at all because they don't see these other events happening, right? Um, something's going to break in the system, right? There's too much debt. The, the regional banks broke, right? They, they put a patch on that and said, okay, we'll bail you out and give you as much money as you need. But something else is going to break. I mean, in Britain, you know, the bond market broke. So um, something's going to break here if interest rates stay at this this level and they're going to have to backtrack and and somehow backdoor QE start to do something again Be, because it, it has a huge effect, right? There, there's way too much debt out there. Consumers are in distress. Um, you know, there was there was one point five trillion dollars of excess capital that American consumers had. Hmm. They, they've dwindled to that at 100 billion a month. They think there's a couple hundred billion of that left of yeah. excess capital. So that gives us a couple months. Costco has said recently that people are buying chicken, not beef. Yeah. Right. Be and that's what always happens when when people are trying to save uh, save what money. Was five ninety nine full rotisserie chicken. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So so the hot dogs are still a buck fifty at Costco. So that's good. But um, people, you know, people are feeling it. I, I've started to hear in the real estate industry that people are now getting very desperate. Right. So I think we're right on the cusp of that. And of course, when something happens, just like in 2008, all the economists and central bankers will say, oh, we never saw this. Nobody saw this coming. Right. That. So I did a book many years ago, Eric Sprott, who everybody knows about in this industry, saw it all coming back in 2006 and 2007. You should have seen the articles he was writing um, at that time, you know, and everybody, everybody thinks you're wrong if you're early. No. Um, and then it all happened. And, and then all the central bankers said, oh, nobody saw this happening. Well, there was a lot of people that did. Yeah, no, a lot of people are seeing it coming right now, right? right? The, the recession right. that has yet to arrive, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple things to follow up on. One is the job market, because um, Powell keeps or puts a lot of emphasis on the job market. And based on what you're saying, it's never going to break the way he expects it to break, right? Uh, just just today, we had job numbers coming out mm -hmm. and jobless claims uh, have dropped to a seven month right. low, right? Right. right? So right. it's a counter indicator. So higher rates for longer, right? And you know, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist that says that, you know, everybody's cooking numbers. I, I think it's got too complicated, really, yeah. to figure it out. There's too many parts pulling in too many directions. And that's why you know, they keep revising numbers and, you know, they're rising them up, revising them down because they don't really know. It's yeah. just too complicated, right? There's too many people, like I said, on disability. There's too many people out of the workforce. There's too many people on entitlements um, and there's too few people working. And 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 yeah, and, and why Powell keeps talking about unemployment is remember, they have two mandates, inflation and employment hmm. of the central bank. So he's trying to focus on, on, on those, but it, I'm sure it's confusing for him because they, they usually don't, start reducing interest rates until they see that empl those employment numbers break the unemployment oh. go up and maybe it's not happening this time so but 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 something else will break no. something else will fix it for him right <laughs> no abs absolutely um we're at a debt gdp ratio of 130 percent right, right now so right. and i always keep bringing up japan a right. bit of a different market bit of a different sure. economy but what's stopping the u.s from going towards japan like i think we're ignoring pers personal opinion there ignoring the mm -hmm. fact that that might actually happen because we keep yeah. saying something needs to break this is not sustainable look at japan they're 260 percent right and they're buying their own bonds and uh, keep issuing money to themselves more or less well remember greenspan said many many years ago in the 80s he said the us will never default on its debt because we have an unlimited ability to print money mm -hmm. and he actually <laughs> said that and i thought wow okay that's, isn't that great <laughs> right so we can print hundreds of trillions of dollars if we need to and we won't default yeah, yeah. but you are defaulting um uh, but not on paper. Um, so yes, with regard to Japan, I think a, a, um, a, a big part of it is, you know, and Ray Dalio has written about this, right? Japan was 20 to 30 years ahead of us on demographics. Mm -hmm. So you can grow your way out of it um, if you got a young population that's investing and working and building, mm -hmm. et cetera. But the US, US unfortunately, is hit Japan scenario now where they were 20 years ago because the demographics are are poor. There's 10,000 people a day retiring, as I said. I mean, when you think of it, that's big, big numbers. Um, and then the amount of money on disability. So yeah, um, I, I I think in order to keep things, you know, a, appropriate, you know, the, the Japan scenario is a very very logical scenario. There's differences. There always is. But uh, but yeah, Japan just keeps buying their own debt. They own no. half their bond market, and now they're owning the stock That's, market. And right, like one one thing, is sovereign debt as well, because a lot of the the U.S. debt is held externally, mm -hmm. right outside outside of the country. Right. I think, but that is changing. I think mm -hmm. like China, for example, is selling their southern debt in the U.S. like mm -hmm. slowly back into the market. Right, they started right. doing that years ago because they saw it coming. 
there's nobody to buy the debt anymore. So the U.S. Um, is buying its own. They got to buy right. their own, and they got to print money to buy their own now. Uh, what, I mean, a third of their debt is coming due in the next year, so I don't know how they're going to refinance that. Now, everybody, the consensus, this, the consensus is, and, and you know, one of the greatest hedge fund managers in history said, he said, the, the only way you make money in the market over time is you look at what everybody, what the consensus is, and then you do the opposite and be right. No. Right? Simple as that, right? Because if, if you're going to be consensus, if you're doing what everybody else, what's already factored in the market, you're not going to make any money. So the consensus is right now, that um, we're gonna have a soft landing and that's what's factored in the market but the consensus also is and everybody knows it is that the u.s has to because of the debt ceiling issue they have to um, put out their trillions of dollars of new money so interest rates must be going to spike dramatically because of all that all, all that issuance but everybody knows that yeah. that's already baked in so i'm not i'm not a believer in that i still think interest rates are gonna are, are gonna surprise everybody and drop as we get this pretty severe um, recessionary time yeah. happening. So, so, so how do you, how do, you um, do that trade? Well, a lot of people don't realize, you know, in 2008, the stock market was down 35%, but long-term bonds, 20 years plus, were up 35%. Mm -hmm. So simple barbell of having the two, no. forgetting about commodities, you, you would have got out of 2008 with yeah. no losses. And, and I think the long bonds have been devastated. I mean, devastated. If you look at TLT in the U.S., which is the long-term bond ETF, I mean, it's got an annualized three-year return of minus 10% a year <laughs> for bonds, Awful. right? I know. Um, that's, but, I but as a private retail investor right now, I look at the bond deals like, why wouldn't, buy, why wouldn't I buy something? 10 year, four and a half percent? Right. Right? right. Like, how, how greedy do I need to get to, to, to buy that? Because as a retail investor, I just buy and hold. Like, I, I don't treat mm -hmm. the thing. Right. right. Like, I wait till maturity, get paid out, and on to the next one, so, right? So take the yield, and you can get a, um, you know, if, if interest rates drop because of recession, you're going to get a nice bounce, 10, 15, 20% in, increase there. You know, in, in, interestingly enough, um, I, I did a book years ago, and one of the money managers in the book was Frank Mersch, and he was a... Uh, um, He's a great resource guy in Canada. And he said he, he's got in, into the business in the early 80s when interest rates were 18 or 19 percent. And he said he had $60,000 at the time, which was a pretty big amount of money. And he said he bought a 30-year strip bond, um, put all the $60,000 into it because it was going to mature in 30 years at over a million dollars, 1.2 million, and, because interest rates were so high. And he said at the time, he said, that's my retirement. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. He was he, he ended up to be worth hundreds of millions of yeah, dollars, yeah. Probably, but he didn't know that at the time. And he said, that's my retirement. That's something going to be worth over a million dollars yeah. guaranteed in in, um, in, in 30 exactly. years. That's why he did it. Right. That's sort of what I'm looking at. Right. Sure. So why not lock that in right now? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it seems fairly high. Yeah. Right. You'll never pit the bottom or the top. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Don't so. don't do it with everything, but take it and say, OK, that's that piece of money that's going to grow yeah. for me and double over the next 12 years because of 75 percent or whatever the case yeah, is. Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let's talk about another potential hedge. Let's talk about commodities. Sure. Right. Yeah. Let's, uh, you, you mentioned it is like might be a good good time for commodities right now. Um, let's focus on gold and silver, obviously. Like right. where, where are we in the market right now? Like how do you rate the, the performance of gold and silver these days? Like how happy are you with the current price? Yeah. Happy with the gold price, unhappy with the stocks. And but I think that's that's logical. I mean, mm -hmm. when you when you raise interest rates dramatically, whether it's the Russell 2000 small cap index in the U.S. or the TSX Venture, anything small cap where you have to take risk has been devastated. So it doesn't matter that they're the gold price is almost at an all time high. The stocks are, are but that creates a phenomenal opportunity, right? You know, Stanley Druckenmiller, the best money manager in history, uh, once said, for, and I think this is very important for people in our industry. He said, forget everything that you see right now that's happening in the market or with the economy, forget it all. He said, look ahead 18 months and envision to yourself what's the world going to look like in 18 months and that's what you invest in now. I think in 18 months, gold stocks are going to have done very, very, very well. So, you know, something that's that's important, we're all trying to time and figure out the bottoms and the tops. What you do is you you say, gold stocks are extreme value right now. If you look at the, I look at the HUI, um, to gold, right? And that's around um, uh, 8.5 right now. Um, it peaked at 10 uh, a few years ago, but it's hardly ever been over nine. So that tells you that gold stocks are very undervalued compared to the gold price. And um, take a position, hold it, don't look at the market every day, and <laughs> let the market come to you, right? 
People don't yeah. do that. They figure they got to be in there doing something every day. Uh, now, the market's just a place to trade, right? If it was a private company, you wouldn't worry about the price every day. And I think that's so important. Let the market come to you, mm -hmm. right? I don't know whether it's going to be three months, six months, or nine I've been months. waiting for a while right, now. Exactly. You know? I was like, come on, buddy. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and Which brings up another great point. You know, I, I, I'm a generalist. I can buy anything for people. But, um, you know, a lot of generalist investors out there say, oh, we, I don't invest in commodities because um, it's so cyclical. You've made no money over 40 years if you bought and hold. Yeah, that's true. OK, um, but but the cycles are huge. The other the other thing that I hear people say is, oh, commodities only work two years or three years out of 10. The problem with that is that, sure, that's right. But the three years out of 10 that they work you're up hundreds and hundreds of percent, you right? Make up for the other 40 right, years. Right, so you just gotta, you just gotta wait on it. Uh, but it, but waiting's hard when everybody's buying NVIDIA and everybody's talking about AI and because it, it pulls you in different yeah. directions, right? Well, patience is wearing thin a little bit, it, right? It, you it, see what's happening 100%. around in the world, like you look at the geopolitical events, you see about the EV revolution and the demand increases that everybody's forecasting, and nothing happens nothing. in the market. Nothing. And I think, <laughs> and I think that's that's why you know something we've talked about a lot in the past is the mining clock. Yeah. And and the mining clock kind of makes it a, a quantitative approach rather than qualitative. In other words, what's what's happening in the market tells you where you are in the cycle. Because believe me, in commodities, you better be getting out when things are are fantastic yeah. and you feel really good because. It's going to do the round trip again, right? We're, we're nowhere near that euphoric stage in anything. But having said that, I was talking, pounding the table three or four years ago, and there, a lot of people thought I was crazy, including money managers, about mm -hmm. uranium. Because it was at four o'clock in the mining clock, right? Four o'clock is the time in which um, prices bottom. Um, there's zero interest in the sector. Companies are bringing, taking projects mm -hmm. offline. Companies are going bankrupt. Uh, companies are reducing their cost if they're producers um, down to, for, to support the new price. And, um, you know, Cameco at that time was, was $10 US, no. right? And here we're at 40 US. So it's, um, you know, there's a 400% there's a gain that has happened already. Now everybody's getting interest <laughs> in uranium and that's good. It, it, I think it's got a great run ahead of it. But, you know, you've, you, you missed 400% no. already, right? <laughs> if you're just getting interested in it now, right? Uh, and, and same with the, with the, with the juniors. So I, I think the mining clock is, is great to kind of look at and say, um, what's happening in the market's telling you um, when to get out and no. we're, we're we'll be talking in three or four years and i'll be saying or five years or whatever and i'll be saying kai everything the mining clock is telling us that no. we shouldn't be invested in these stocks anymore right that's that's a long cycle though it is it is so it I, is. I like what you just said three to five years like right because this market needs to sort of reflourish a little bit it, it right? does right there's been a lot of damage done psychology no. you know jim, jim rogers great money manager says skip the degree in finance if you want to do well in finance get a degree in history psychology and philosophy yeah. right philosophy teaches you how to be a nonlinear thinker look at every look at the same things everybody else is looking at and drive a different conclusion no absolutely right? and 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 that's why the consensus is so important to examine consensus is um soft landing yeah. consensus is that higher for longer interest rates um and and the consensus is that interest rates are going to increase rapidly here because um the uh um the issuances that have to be done so and that's why the short position on 10-year bonds is at an all-time high you it, it's the same it's the same as it was in the third quarter of 2018 and you know what the mining sector was going <laughs> through at that time and what it did in 2019 after that um, and uh, and it was the same as it was at the end of 2015, um, the short the short yeah. position. In other words, expecting interest rates to to rise substantially. Well, both times the market did the opposite. Interest rates <laughs> dropped substantially, yeah. and gold and silver and and commodities in general went up dramatically. Absolutely. Let's stay on the price themselves, the price movements of gold mm -hmm. and silver right now. We're 1918 as we're recording this here on uh, September 7th. Uh, in mm -hmm. gold, silver is a little lower, 24. I didn't check the silver price. I forgot. It was around 24 dollars. Um, but as I said, like how happy are you with the price? Let's let's explain the price moves of the last couple of months and try a little forecasting if if possible. Sure, I, you know, I and and silver um, is funny. It's such a small industry, and it's so easy to push the price around, right? I mean, I'm I'm a little disenchanted. Gold, silver, you know, other commodities, because the futures market was made for producers to lock in a particular price in the future because obviously 
you want to know the price you're going to get for your commodity in the future so that you can plan your business accordingly. Yeah. The futures market was not invented for manipulation and, and, and pushing the price yeah. all over the place was in the futures market. I mean, but, but that's what happens, right? So yes, um, I look a lot at the commitment of traders report on a weekly basis because unfortunately, um, <laughs> banks, the bullion banks never lose money, yeah. right? So if they're very, 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 very short, it, you, the price is going down. Mm. That's what's going to happen, right? Hedge funds, interesting enough, are the dumb money. <laughs> um, they load in at load in at the top and short at the bottom. Don't know why. So I don't pay attention to them. I pay attention to the bullion banks. Mm. Bullion banks, um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of net long silver at the bottom and silver rose up to a mm -hmm. nice price here recently. And then unfortunately, they've gone all short again. So it so wow. now the price is going down again, right? So we have to be cognizant of how they're pushing around the price on a, mm -hmm. on a daily on a daily and weekly basis. But again, I don't think that matters in 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 the midterm um, because I, I think you know silver is going to going to rise fairly dramatically over mm -hmm. the next few years as well as all the as well as other commodities, right? Now, um, um, I, I think that you know the demand obviously is, is is great as long as the supply doesn't come out of nowhere, right? And that's yeah. what happened with uranium. People were very positive on uranium for a lot of years, and then the supply kept coming from everywhere. And that's, you know, Japanese utilities are shut down. They got millions of pounds. They're just selling just, it on the market, right? right? So the ja and Rick Rule said, you know, a long time ago, he said that the, the, imp the, the catalyst for uranium will be when the Japanese restart, and they've started to restart, and, and, and we see uranium doing, doing well. And it's the same for, for, for other things. I mean, silver, what people forget and I'm very bullish on on silver. I mean, the gold silver ratio, the the supply demand, the solar. There's so many positives for the area. Um, but what people do forget is if the price rises dramatically in a very short period of time, which I'm, <laughs> I don't want to happen. I'd rather just to be a nice <laughs> increase. What that does is it brings out all the recycling and you know all the supply that you didn't know was around and all this <laughs> sort of stuff, right? So we'd like to see a sustained bull market based upon fundamentals and not somebody pushing around the price in the futures market just to make themselves some trader making themselves money for the bank and for themselves. Yeah, it's short term pushes like we've seen the silver right. squeeze in February. When right. was that 21? I believe. Right, right. right. So you don't want to see that happen because it's not sustainable. It's like a pump and dump in any mining stock. Right? That, that's They're right. usually not sustainable. That, exactly. Absolutely. So you like to see a sustainable rally based upon fundamentals. And I, and I think gold is holding in there extremely well, um, really, in the face of so many things going against it. Gold's up 6% this year. Yeah. I mean, the stocks aren't, I know, but gold's held in there extremely well. So you can imagine when, when, when instead of being a huge headwind, it's an actual tailwind. I, I think it'll surprise people um, for what, what gold does. And then the stocks show two to three times um, the, 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 the mid caps do, the juniors show five times the, the, the increase in the, in the gold price when, when, when they take off. Let's talk about the mining stocks. Like you, you brought that up, and I, I pulled up uh, Newmont here because I want to see what their dividend yield is right now. Mm -hmm. It's four point eight percent. Right, almost five. So yeah. they are competing with the uh, you know the bonds, mm -hmm. but they're actually like and I checked Chevron earlier. Chevron is about a three point seven percent bond right, yield. Right. We're actually beating the oil companies because yeah. usually if you want a dividend yield, you buy the oil stocks, right? They used to be quite good in that regard. And that brings up a great point. If I can kind of talk about history a little bit yeah, again, yeah. if I can do that. Um, the oil and gas industry, and mining isn't far behind it, is the most hated industry in the world, right? It's under extreme social pressure because of the carbon. Mm -hmm. It's under extreme political pressure. The governments of the world basically say they want their oil business out of business. Um, and it's under taxation pressure, right? Mm -hmm. so it, um, excess taxation of profits, et cetera. So what are the oil companies not doing right now? They're not reinvesting in their businesses. Chevron just bought back $78 billion worth of stock, right? They're increasing dividends. They're going to pay special dividends over time. Mm -hmm. They're not reinvesting in their businesses. Why would you if governments say they want you out of business, <laughs> right? So um, there was one sector that this happened to many, many years ago. And I, I just study history so much because markets don't change yeah. and markets don't change because people don't change. Markets are just people, yeah. right? So people just don't human change. human behavior, right? That, that's right. So... Um, so this happened to one other sector, um, and my, my, my friend at uh, Stiefel uh, wrote this report. I, I didn't do the research <laughs> on it, he did. Um, but um, the sector that this happened to, political pressure, social pressure, and taxation pressure, 
insurmountable pressure on the industry. It happened to the tobacco industry in the mid 80s. Okay? From, from that time on, um, tobacco companies didn't reinvest in their businesses. They increased their dividends dramatically. They, they paid out yeah. special dividends to shareholders. They bought back their stock. They didn't know what to do. They had so much excess cash because they weren't reinvesting in their businesses. Why would you? Um, so from 1985 to 2005, so basically over that 20 year period, the best performing stock on the Toronto Stock Exchange was Rothman's mm -hmm. tobacco yeah. it was up 12,000%. Not including all the dividends paid out and the special dividends, yeah. et cetera. And, and there was a chart given on that. Um, then you say, well, Canada's Canada. <laughs> Let's look at the U.S. market. What, what was what was a, a great performing stock there? It was Philip Morris, which was also up 12,000 percent. So you see, generally speaking, and I think most listeners of your show will agree with this. The more government gets involved, the more they get their fingers involved, the ac opposite actually happens of what no. they're trying to achieve. Right. And, Usually. And, yeah. and, and that was the situation that happened with there. And I think that's happening with with energy stocks right now because it, it's the same blueprint. And again, mining's not that far behind, right? Yeah. So, so why is why is tech or Newmont going to reinvest in their business dramatically? They aren't. They're going to raise their dividends. Yeah. They're going to increase their. Um, now, it is a depleting asset, so they do have to make sure their pipeline's still still going. But they're not getting aggressive because uh, you know uh, Mexico doesn't like open pit mines now. Um, you know, all these countries in the world are, are lining yeah. up, and permitting takes years and years and years. And they're saying, well, OK, we're not going to take that risk. We're just going to um, uh, raise our dividends and pay it out to shareholders. Yeah. Where are we on the mining clock for the mining stocks right now, for particularly the precious metals miners? And, and interesting to see that because, yeah, I, you know, I, a, lot, a lot of high profile people here in Canada haven't heard of the mining clock. It was invented in South Africa and, uh, um, and it hasn't made its way across the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I was going over this with Ross Beatty, actually. Oh, um, I got him here in the studio tomorrow. So, oh, okay. okay. Well, I don't know if he'll remember this, but 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 he kind of he kind of got a bit grumpy with me on the mining crock, and he's like, "Well, you know, all, all the commodities are different spots. I mean, copper is different than gold and uranium, and and he, it was true. He yeah. he was right. Um, so so yes, we have. I'll, I'll talk on on a few different commodities where they are in the mining clock. As I said. You know, two or three years ago, um, gold and silver were probably seven o'clock. And at seven o'clock, uh, when, when prices are high, you start to get financings come in. You remember what happened in 2020, yeah. September of 2020, lots of financings came in. And that's fine. That money goes into the ground and then you start to make discoveries, right? Um, there hasn't been a lot of great discoveries, but there's been some discoveries, snow, snow line, et cetera, that, that have happened over the, past, um, over the past few years. Uranium, though, at the time was four o'clock. Right. No money was coming in the sector. Everybody hated it. Production was still no. going down, et cetera. So uranium's caught up now to, to gold and silver. We're probably at the same spot. Um, nothing euphoric. Um, copper is, is, is probably around the same spot, too, right? Mm -hmm. um, there isn't really a lot of money. But the, the, sorry to interrupt there, mm -hmm. Bob. The clock doesn't get rewound because it feels like we're not at 7 o'clock. It feels like we're at 2 o'clock. That, that's a great right. point. The clock goes back and forth. <laughs> that's right. It can go backwards. Right. And I think we've had some backwards. Uh, uranium's moved forward. Other commodities have moved backwards in the past uh, past little bit. But again, the definition is um, falling prices um, represent two, three, four o'clock. Uh, we aren't getting falling prices in commodities. Mm. Copper, I mean, oh, no, they, not they, the commodities. Like you're, they might right. have pulled back a little bit, but but again, they're not at their lows, right? Gold, we're, we're double where gold was in uh, December 2015, right? Gold was at 1,050. Uh, we're double that. Um, and, and silver hit 14 or whatever the Q12, I think it was, and we're at 23. So, so we're still in uptrends, right? And, and you know, I, I talked to Eric Sprott frequently, and, and Eric said that to me recently. He said, everybody's concerned, but we're in an uptrend. There's higher <laughs> highs and higher lows. That, that's a bull market. I, I know it doesn't feel like a bull market, but it's higher highs and higher lows uh, as far as the commodity prices yeah. are, 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 are concerned. So, so yeah, we're, we're not back at 3 o'clock where companies are getting liquidated. Uh, there's lots of cash. Right, Glencore, as you know, remember, almost went bankrupt. I mean, that was that was at three o'clock, yeah. right? That was when these companies um, were in desperate trouble. We're not there right now, so we're still at five, six, seven, seven o'clock. Um, what happens at nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, is that you get um, paper takeovers of, of companies so with premiums. With, yes, yes, that, that's right, because they're so desperate to spend this excess money. The cost of production goes up rapidly. The debt load goes goes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And mining companies did this back in 2011, 2012, um, and they blew themselves up. And, you know, that'll happen again. It's just it's just what happens in the cycle. Um, but interesting enough, we talk about the mining clock, but the mining clock 
it, it's basically a function of of money raising in the market, right? You got to raise money before you find discoveries. Once you find discoveries, then people start overpaying for those discoveries, and, and so it makes sense. The same thing happened exactly in the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. We could have called it the cannabis <laughs> clock, no. right? I, I had a young guy work for me at the time, and it was late 2017. And he said, "Bobby, I know, I know, you're kind of an old guy. You just don't understand. Like people are going to be smoking so much more of this, and and and." chewables and all this sort of stuff this industry is exploding i said your thesis is correct and i said and i said based upon what i see in the market and i'll explain it here because i think history is important i said based upon what i see in the market i think in the next five years people will be using a lot more cannabis products for medical purposes for smoke whatever the case is but i think most of the stocks will be down 80 to 90 percent and he goes, but how could that be? I said, because we're in a euphoric binge right now. You're you're overpaying when when um, uh, you know Aurora Cannabis with a six billion dollar market cap paid a billion dollars for some company that was worth nothing three months before in paper. Yeah. I said, yeah, that's ten o'clock on the mining clock. We're at the end, and sure enough, here we are. Right, at Tilray it was at two hundred dollars, and it's four dollars an hour, whatever the case is. Right, um, and uh, we're we're not there in mining, but but. Just keep that in mind because we will, we will be one day and, and keep that in mind. All right. Right. <laughs> um, Bob, Bob, to put a bow around the conversation as well, I, I threatened to ask you that uh, what, what are your clients doing right now? Because you, you work with a lot of mining CEOs as well. Like how much consoling do you have to do and uh, how are they deploying their capital? Right in, now? Interesting because, yeah, uh, mining CEOs are are engrossed in their business, right? <laughs> so, I mean, things aren't great, but but they're putting their heads down. They're plotting ahead. They're building their business, right? Yeah. Um, they're getting options, warrants, which are cheap, which is amazing because those <laughs> are going to be worth so much money in th three or four or five years yeah. from now. Um, you, you know, but not diluting their shoulders or anything like that. Just normal, normal sort of sort of procedures. But most of them are not doing a lot on the investment front. They're putting their heads down and saying, "I'm building this business yeah. and I'm plugging ahead." Now. When the cycle turns and we get these euphoric rises, that's why we have the mining clock. That's why we manage money for mining executives, because that's going to be the time. And it's going to be a struggle. I'm going to because they're going to feel amazing. Yeah. I'm going to say now is the time to take a bunch of money off the table, create your family legacy, make sure that your kids are going to university for the next cycle that's coming, because undoubtedly a lot of it will be given back. Right. <laughs> when, when the cycle happens. Absolutely. When the cycle right. happens. Right. So you're, usually I, I tend to say or I tend to think at least that mining executives or mining people ingrained in the mining industry are also some of the best investors in the mining industry because mm -hmm. they follow it closely. So right. I was curious, but you said they're, they've got their head down. They're not really investing right now, which I'm not sure where to put right now, because usually if they were smart, yeah. they'd be gobbling up the bargains. Well, the, the problem is in, in any industry at the bottom, you don't have any cash. Good point. <laughs> You've got all the cash you have at the top, right? Yeah. So, you know, if, if if they're working for, they're not working for free, but they're not making a lot of money, they're not being able to exercise a lot of options at, at premiums. So that's kind of why I go put your head down. But Pierre Lassonde said, you know, recently he said, and I'm sure people are going to are gonna laugh when I say this, but Pierre Lassonde said, investing in gold stocks is the easy, easiest sector in the world to make money in. He said, because the, the highs are so high and the lows are so low, he said, you just have to invest when everybody hates it. <laughs> and he says, then just be patient for a short period of time. And he said, you, you do so well. And, and interestingly enough, let's, let's talk about a guy that everybody knows again, um, Eric Sprott. Uh, my, my book a few years ago that I did, you know, Eric was not always a gold investor. People don't realize that he managed money um, for Sprott for 25 years from 1982 to 2007. You weren't making a lot of money in gold stocks in the 80s. Um, but he did. He, he owned 10% of Taser and oil and gas stocks, and he was a great growth investor. But he said the reason he came back to the mining sector is because he said the highs are so high and the lows are so low, the difference between the two is hundreds and hundreds of percent. And he said there's no other sector <laughs> in the world that, that you can make those sort of gains. Um, and I thought that was that was fascinating. Ross Beattie said that too, you know, with the, with the copper in 2002 when he started investing in that. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Bob, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. Where, where can we find more of you? 
Uh, great, Jeb. Uh, BobThompson.ca and all my media appearances are there. Um, got lots of. Um, uh, I write something called the Gold Digger, yeah. which, which if anybody wants that, that's fantastic. It's Thompson Investments um, at RaymondJames.ca, and the Gold Digger comes out monthly, and we we talk about these topics, but uh, but also a lot of these. Uh, uh, where we are on the mining clock, etc. You have yet to put me on that list. Yes. Okay. Please I'm sorry. Me. We'll do Please it right, me. right away. Okay. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic conversation. I really appreciate it. Now, uh, let me find the right camera. There it is. Thank you so much for joining us. We, we, I really hope you enjoyed this conversation here with Bob Thompson. Go, go reach out to him. The Gold Digger is a really good read. I've seen copies of it. I haven't gotten <laughs> the regular issues. Okay. But uh, it's really helpful to, to understand where we are at in the cycle. I already see the YouTube comments popping up, but oh, it's a wait and see kind of things. Like, it's true, right? It doesn't change the fact. But gold is where it's at. We all know what's happening on the macroeconomic levels. You have to position yourself when it's down. You have to be patient. See how long you can be patient, because my patience personally is wearing quite thin as well. Um, but there's always light at the end of the tunnel, right? So there's things happening. Make sure to subscribe to the channel as well for some more up-to-date information on what is happening in the gold, silver, and copper space, commodity space in general, in the markets as well, because I know 80, 85% of you are not subscribed. We really want to hear from you. Hit that like button as well. It helps us tremendously with the visibility of our videos and interviews. So that way we get more great guests like Bob Thompson on the show here as well. And uh, really appreciate your time tuning. Thank you so much. We'll be back with more here from Vancouver.